Hey everybody. Uh, so I'm going to do a little a little uh, video here on um, the method of exhaustion. Um, this is the name sometimes given to a, a method for determining um, uh, determining the area of a circle. We're not really going to do it necessarily precisely the way it has been done uh, in antiquity when it was first done. So we're kind of doing a mix of the idea with some modern uh, notions of calculus. But the purpose is just to sort of get the idea of uh, the limiting the limiting function we use in integral calculus to get areas, right? It's a very similar sort of setup. Um, and it's got some nice geometry problems in it. So I've got here a circle. <clears throat> and the idea is that we're going to uh, uh, inscribe in it a, a regular polygon. So what I mean is that, so I've kind of gotten the drawing prepared because it was a little time consuming. Um, if you just look at the outside of this polygon, right, I, I guess I have a um, hexagon here. By regular, I mean, let's pretend that I drew it perfectly and all of its, uh, all of its sides are the same length, okay? Um, I'm gonna use that in my, in my uh, determination of the area here. Um, of course, it's not perfect, but you get what I'm, what I'm going after. So I want to figure out the idea is we're going to if you look at this inscribed polygon, right, we're missing a little bit of area. We don't we don't capture these these portions in here. But if we were to then maybe make it a 12 sided polygon so I could draw, you know, little little versions like this, if those were actually straight lines to make this a little better. Right. We'll start to capture more of that area that we're missing and we can go we can go further and further capturing more and more of the area. Uh, as we get more and more sides. So we'll take the limit of, oops, all right, I guess it won't let me erase that one. We'll take the limit of this, uh, hmm, I guess there's no way to do it. That red line's gonna stay. Okay, um, we're going to take the limit of, we're gonna try to write an expression for the area of an n-sided polygon um and see what happens as we take the limit as we imagine making more and more and more polygons okay so i've drawn a six-sided polygon here but we're going to imagine that uh that's an arbitrary number and i'm going to try to figure out its area and the way i'm going to do it the reason i've drawn all these triangles is because i know how to find areas of triangles so let's take one of these triangles out or imagine that we've taken one out. I'm gonna draw one of the triangles out here. So imagine this is one of the triangles and it's the central angle here, which I'll call theta. And remember, it's a regular polygon, so these are all going to be the same central angle, okay? They're all gonna be theta. Um, it's uh, not terribly difficult to see that. We're splitting up the uh, the circle into equal portions, right? And also remember each of these, the sides of these triangles have a radius of R, okay? Because each of these is a radius. It goes from the center to the point on the circle. So in this triangle here, I have R and R, and theta is my angle there, okay? So let's name a few things, or actually we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's figure out the area of this triangle. I need to know two things, right? I need to know how tall it is, call that H. And I need to know uh, uh, this base, okay? So I'll use big B for the base here, and I also might need these half bases right on each side because notice if i've drawn this height here it's going to hit at a right angle and the angle between the height and one of these sides is theta over two so let's now think about that triangle for a moment because right triangles are nice to work with so this is base over two this is h this is theta over two, and this is r. Let's see if we can get an expression for the base and the height in terms of theta and r, okay, right? Remember, if we were looking for the 
uh, area of a, tri of a circle, we're going to know the radius. So r is known. Theta is also going to be known in a sense. We'll get to that in a moment. So I want to do everything in terms of r and theta right now. So what is the, let's think about h. I know that if I take the cosine of theta over 2, that's equal to h over r, which means h equals r cosine theta over 2. Right. In the same way, we will get uh, b over 2 is equal to uh, r sine theta over 2. Oh wait, let's let me let me let me change my notation. Sorry, I don't need b over two. It's not the same b anyways. Let's just call it little b. I think that'll be easier. That's confusing me. But we'll just call that little b. Little b is the half base. Big b is the full base. Pardon me for that. All right. So I've got my base and my height. So the area of this triangle right here. Let's call this. Uh, We'll call this, uh, let's call it area of the little base is going to be uh, one half base times height, which is one half the product of these two things. So we have two r's, so we'll get an r squared. We'll have cosine of theta over two and sine of theta over two, which means the area of the larger triangle using the big B is just twice this, right? This is the area of half of it. So if I take twice this, we're going to get R squared cosine theta over 2 sine of theta over 2. Okay? So there's a formula for one of the triangles. However, the area of the whole parallel uh, uh, polygon is how is the area of one of these triangles times the number of triangles there are, which is going to be the same as the number of sides there are. So let's call this a sub n. This is the area of the polygon with n sides is going to be n times this whole thing, n times r squared cosine theta over 2 sine theta over 2. Okay, so notice what we have right now. We have an expression for the area of the polygon inscribed in the circle um, with n sides with a radius of r and the central angle of theta, right? So if we were doing this problem, r would be given, if we were trying to find the area of an actual circle, we know it's radius. Um, we're going to take a limit as n goes to infinity, so hopefully this all works out and the n's disappear somehow. But we've got to figure out what to do with theta. However, theta is changing depending on n. So theta, right, if, if there are n sides to the polygon, that means there are n central angles, these angles in the middle. So if I take n times theta, that's adding all of these up, I go all the way around the circle which we know to be 2 pi. So that theta becomes 2 pi over n. Okay, so now we can put that into our expression. Theta over 2 is just taking half of this, so this becomes pi over n sine of pi over n. And here, is an expression for the area of an n-sided poly regular polygon inscribed in the center of a circle, okay? All right, now let me make one quick mention before we go forward. You might notice this, and if you have a bunch of trig identities well remembered, there's a half angle formula that you could replace this with and get something a little different. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it as written um, uh, because it takes sort of the least amount of, um, you know, formulas you might have memorized. I imagine most of us have seen, probably all of us have seen the half angle formula. 
I know that there's a square root. I know the sine one has a, has a minus, I think, and the cosine has a plus. It's, I, I can't remember which one exactly. Let's do it without having to look it up. We can do it as is. That might simplify the problem if you happen to have that, but we don't actually need it. Okay, so I've drawn again a hexagon where n equals six, but this represents any sized, uh, any, any, if I wanted a 10-sided regular polygon, this would give me the area inside the circle, okay? And if you're curious, you can take a radius of one um, and plug in various values of n and see if they get to what we know the area to be, right? The area of the circle is pi r squared. If the radius is one, it's pi. If you plug in these values, if you plug in, for instance, n equals 10, you should get some number. And if you make it closer, to, if you make it larger, you should get some number closer to pi, right? And from the picture, it also looks like we should get numbers less than pi. We're missing some area, okay? I'll leave that up to you if you wanna check some of those, okay? Also, a word of warning, I'm doing this in radians, right? I did two pi as all the way around the circle, so make sure if you are checking it, you're in, uh, you're using a calculator that, that uses radians. Okay, so now here's our big leap. The area of the circle, let's just do this, we're going to hope is the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n. So for if I, if I take n larger and larger and larger, I'm presuming this number or this sequence of numbers, this is a list of numbers, right? For each n, there's a new area as we get more and more of this area taken up by the polygon. That that list of numbers, as I get n larger and larger n, is just going to get closer and closer to, to what we know the area to be, right? We know the area of the circle should be pi r squared. So we're hoping that that shows up by the end. All right, so let's try to take this, this limit. So let's see. This is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of n times r squared times cosine of pi over n times sine of pi over n. We can pull that r squared out. r, r is a constant as far as the limit is concerned. And I've got n times cosine of pi over n times sine of pi over n, okay? Now, I'm not gonna go through, if we, if we want to use our limit laws, um, there's a few that we can use here, but what I, what I wanna notice is that um, n goes to infinity, cosine, if pi, if pi over n, pi over n goes to zero, so cosine's getting closer and closer to one, and then sine, pi over n, again, is getting closer and closer to zero, and sine of zero is zero, so sine of pi over n is getting closer and closer to zero. So we've got some, a number close to one multiplied by a number close to zero, something very small here, times a number that's getting larger and larger and larger, right? So we have uh, limits that are going towards infinity versus limits that are going towards zero. When we have this kind of tug, it's often the case that we can use L'Hopital's rule. However, we need it to look to be in a particular form. So I'm going to do a little algebraic trick here. And I'm going to rewrite this thing in the following way. OK. So now, this is the exact same thing, right? n never equals zero, so this is a totally legal move. The numerator, right, the cosine of pi over n, like I said, goes to, this goes to the, pi over n goes to zero, which means cosine is going towards one, sine is going towards zero, so the numerator's limit is zero, right? That's using some of our limit laws. And the denominator's limit is zero. So when we have this, when we have zero over zero as our limits of the quotient of functions, we have an indeterminate form and L'Hopital's rule applies. In other words, if the limit uh, as, let's just say x goes to a uh, of f of x equals zero, and the limit as x goes to a of g of x equals zero, then the limit the limit as x goes to a of f of x over g of x is equal to the limit as 
x goes to a of f prime of x over g prime of x, if that limit exists. This is one part of L'Hopital's rule, the part that we care about right now. Okay, so we have this. We have a function in the numerator going to zero and a function in the denominator. Okay, you can you can use the limit laws, right? You take the limit of the numerator, you take the limit of each part of the product. You can you can move the limit inside the function because uh, they're they're continuous and so forth. So we're going to take the limit or the derivatives of the numerator and the denominator. Let's just come over here and do this. So I'm I'm cheating a little bit here, right? I am thinking of n as a function. Uh, as a continuous function taking derivatives, but really it's just hitting the integers. Um, but we can treat it that way. There's a, there's a theorem about, um, about this that we actually haven't learned yet, uh, but it's a pretty, this function matches cosine and sine on the integers uh, as, as a function of x, and so we can take, lim take limits and derivatives in the same way, uh, is all I want to say at this point. So let's see what we can do here. Uh, let's take the derivative with respect to n of cosine of pi over n, sine of pi over n. We have to use a product rule and a chain rule. So we'll take the derivative of the first thing, which is going to be negative sine of pi over n times the second thing. So I just get a squared there. But the derivative of the inside is we've got the derivative of pi over n or pi times n to the negative one, we pick up another negative and then we have pi over n squared. So this is going to become positive. Okay. Then we'll take the derivative of sine, which will become cosine and we'll get cosine of pi over n times the cosine that was already there, it becomes squared. But now we get that negative coming out and there's no negative to cancel with it. So we end up with negative pi over n squared. That's our numerator. The denominator, this one's a little bit easier, negative one over n squared. Okay. Now, I want to express again, it's a little bit of a cheat to take derivatives of n this way, um, but I think it's, it's worth it at this moment before we dig into the idea of limits of sequences and stuff, which those of you moving into uh, later calculus courses will see. So this is a little bit of a cheat here. Um, okay, so now these are our two functions that we can put in. So I'm replacing the numerator with Let's factor out that pi over n squared, and I'm left with sine squared pi over n minus cosine squared pi over n. And I've got negative one over n squared in the denominator. Let's do a little bit of algebra on this expression before we try to take the limit. This is the limit as n goes to infinity. Well, we've got a one over n squared in the numerator and the denominator, so these two things will cancel. So we're left with a negative, and we've got ourselves a pi. Oh, let's just go ahead and move pi out front. It's a constant being multiplied here, so I'm just gonna put my pi right there. What's left inside? I've got negative sine squared pi over n plus cosine squared pi over n, right? I had a negative in the denominator that I distributed. Pi is a constant, it moved out front. All right, home stretch. So now we see we can, let's write this part out since we're at the end. We've got two continuous functions. We can move the limit inside. This is negative sine squared of the limit as n goes to infinity of pi over n. This was a theorem from earlier in calculus part of the limit laws, right? Both of those limits are zero. Well, sine of zero is zero, so zero squared is zero, the negative goes away, we're left with a one, and all that's sitting here is the area of a circle. All 
Okay, and that's it, right? So again, I should acknowledge there's a little bit of a cheat in there. Not that there's something wrong. My notation was a little bit cheap, but I think since we haven't had experience with that stuff yet, likely um, I didn't want to make it overly complicated, except to say limits of these kinds of things, what we call sequences, can be treated by using functions and all the rules we have there. And so that's, that's really what I was using there. This is a little bit wrong. I should have switched to X, but I thought that would make it worse. Maybe telling you about that makes it even worse. Who knows? Um, but there's our area formula popping out of all of that um, after a nice little geometric uh, exploration of this idea. Um, okay, that's it, everybody. Um, thanks. I will see you next time.